today we are going to start the first uh, session of a two part series on the subjectivity and the objectivity of sound and uh, how it actually comes across as uh, what one would call as performivity or in the act of performing are you as a listener as a to a large extent even performer like which role are you playing because this role tends to move around a lot depending upon the composition the context of the performance and the way that sound kind of gets transmitted into musical expression and is received by the immediate audience and now in the age of technology even with a virtual audience so with so many different layers going around between what acts as an object in sound as opposed to what perceives the object as a subject in sound there are a lot of things which can be analyzed can be understood can be broken down in a way that your mind is able to discern any composition or any piece of music that you hear or for example experience in a concert or in any other way that you consume music your mind is able to discern that information and uh, is able to put them up in different juxtapositions in a way that you are able to create completely new ideas about where music can go ahead in the future now that we are in 2023 with the advent of ai all of us know how uh, how music is going ahead it's going ahead in leaps and bounds like the level of plugins that are coming out the kind of things that ai can do has completely revolutionized the way that we are experiencing music as well so especially in the field of objectivity and subjectivity of what you would call as a performance is going to slowly and steadily change to a degree where it's not just about uh, the ingenuity or the originality of a composition that would be appreciated but as well how is the listener how is the performer interacting with it in a way that the whole experience is cohesive that the whole experience is an integrated uh, audio visual uh, experience in general so with that being said i would like to just read through an introduction to the course that i've written and uh, we can slowly start to take it ahead from there and slowly start to enter into sound as performivity followed by some musical examples which we can uh, both uh, together dissect understand and see what aspects of subjectivity what aspects of objectivity do those pieces actually hold so today is just going to be an intro to all of this and in the next one we'll be deep diving into subjectivity objectivity and performivity in greater detail and in segregated parts as well so that we kind of get it in uh, a way that we can come up with our own ideas of mixing all of these together uh if mr gerard is fine with it we would probably have an assignment based on that in the end so we could probably do that you know something that will be fun to do okay so without further ado let's uh, get started i've got some material prepared and i'm going to go through it okay so a quick intro to the course so this course is a profound exploration of the dynamic relationship between objectivity and subjectivity within the realm of sound performivity we delve into this fascinating world where sound transcends its mere existence as auditory vibrations and becomes a powerful vehicle for questioning the boundaries between the objective and the subjective at its core this course would be revolving around the idea that sound is not just an art form but a profound means of inquiry into the very nature of reality human expression and the complex interplay 
between the tangible and the intangible. Sound as a medium of artistic expression and a fundamental component of our everyday lives serves as a lens through which we scrutinize the dualities of objectivity and subjectivity. Throughout our journey, we will grapple with these fundamental questions through the duration of this course. So coming up to the basic foundation of this course, that is, what is sound performivity? In this, we will explore how sound goes beyond being a passive sensory input and transforms into a performative act. How does the act of creating, shaping, and experiencing sound bridge the gap between objectivity and subjectivity? That's one of the main things that we're going to be getting into. So the first question that uh, comes up in uh, such a situation is, as we start this, so is sound an object or is sound an event? If I would think of an object, I would also start to think about maybe postmodern positions where the score itself was left to the performer to decide how to be played. If you are looking at probably the works of John Cage or something, uh, the score itself is an object that the performer would experience in a way the score itself starts to become an object, right? It becomes a geom some, some of these uh, postmodern compositions have geometric scores, which need to be experienced in a certain way. And every time a performer experiences that score, the result or the product is extremely different. So, so I'm just trying to open up the mind before we probably progress, but uh, Excellent. Yes, the concert is uh, probably the best example of an event where you go for it and uh, everything that's happening to you is kind of coming from an object. So, yes, well, you can define it as an object. Is sound an object or an event? Here, we will be navigating through the intricate spectrum where sound oscillates between being a concrete object defined by measurable attributes like pitch and duration and an ephemeral event shaped by personal interpretations, emotions, and narratives. So in this context, we can say that anything which is probably measurable by pitch and duration, which is almost all of music, you can look at it from an objective perspective and call it an object, or if you look at it from the perspective of the listener, of a, of a listener who has very little musical background, for them, a piece of music, which could have duration, which could have pitch, which could have all the objects that make that music possible, could just be perceived as emotions right, could just be perceived as, oh, this is the most beautiful love song I've ever heard. This is the saddest tune I've ever heard. In their experience at that time, it's more like an event than an object, even though the object is right in front of them. The object that it's probably going from a C major seven to a D minor seven and so on and so forth is happening in front of them. Probably the time signatures that it's going in a 3-4 measure. But for them, the experience is happening in a very subjective way. So that's kind of the way we're going to start to look at uh, each example as well that is going to follow is which aspect of something in a composition is being presented as an object and which aspect of it is being experienced in a very subjective way. And there are gonna be some examples that we're gonna be presenting in which the barriers between these two are going to be very, very, very lucid. It's intermingling beautifully. So that's kind of uh, some of the things we're going to be looking into. The next question comes up is, 
do objective attributes of sound exist or must we really construct them in this case we will challenge the notion of inherent objectivity in sound and contemplate how we as creators and listeners shall construct objective attributes while preserving the room for subjective interpretation now this becomes extremely true in the case of everyone in this hall right now because we are here as people who are studying music who are here to do it professionally in a way that we are taking informed decisions about it so with being the artist in power with being the artist with the knowledge with being the artist with a mind that is able to discern sound and a heart which is able to express it we are at this juncture where we can create pieces of music we can create performances which can have the most powerful objectivity in it but can permeate a listener or the experiencer in ways that the subjectivity is of the highest order in terms of emotional impact emotional intelligence and what it what message does it leave behind with them going ahead with this as we keep speaking about object now that we are going to start to look into examples as well one of the best ways that i found while presenting this or working on presenting this is why don't we start to make this a little simpler because if we keep discussing on this tone it gets extremely abstract it gets extremely theoretical it gets extremely a little bit boring as well what if we start to look at the idea of the object and place a body out there what if we place the body what if we place a human body and now use this body as the object and then try to understand the relation that it's creating with the listeners and its immediate environment so those are the kind of examples that we picked up and we're going to be now looking at everything which has a bodily existence as a source of expression so here we will examine the profound relationship between sound and the physical body from the performer's gestures to the listener's emotional and physical responses we will uncover how sound remains intimately connected to corporeal experiences in this course we're going to be inviting participants that is you guys embark on an intellectual and sensory journey inviting you to explore the rich tapestry of sound as it oscillates between being an object to being an event as it intertwines objectivity and subjectivity and it resonates with the overall human experience which happens to be the beautiful thing that we all love that is music so by the end of this exploration you will not only have a deeper understanding of sound performativity but also a heightened appreciation for the complex interplay of objectivity and subjectivity in the world of sound now is when we're going to be diving into this so first header is sound as a body bodylessness or embodiment through the performer now how is all this going to get expressed through the performer now the topics that was so abstract till now we were just discussing objects subjects performance like you know uh, all of this was still very abstract now we're going to put a body to it and give it a performer so that we understand the overall situation of and series in examples now at its core sound as a body bodyliness or embodiment through the performer is an exploration of the corporeal dimension of sound 
where it becomes intimately connected to the performer, echoing their emotions, intentions, and even the physical movements. In this aspect of sound performativity, we will be delving deep into the idea that sound is not just a sequence of waves, but rather a living entity, a body of its own, molded and shaped by the artist who breathes life into it. Now, we're going to get into the concept of bodiliness. What can be called as bodiliness in sound? What's a body of sound? How are you experiencing sound through the body of a performer? When you see the body of a singer, when you see the body of a guitar player, when you see the body of a conductor, when you see the body of a violin soloist, you are experiencing sound in a very different way in all of these contexts, right? Now that when you're talking about being the pianist and uh, performing, now in your mind, uh, when you are practicing the same piece alone at home, and when you're performing in front of the audience, can you exactly tell me what is it that changes? Because when you are performing at home, you are in a to a large extent performing as an object. Like you are the object, you are the performer, you are the, you are the musician, you are embodying that sound. Yes, but you are not receiving any subjectivity from your environment. Why? Because the only things that surround you at that time are probably your bed, your living room, your, you know, the, the tables in your room. That's probably the only thing that surrounds you. So you are not getting human subjectivity or you would say uh, feedback, live feedback. So how does that experience differ from the experience of performing on stage and what what does the stage give you that changes your performance completely? Now you're going to be stretching the dynamics more. Now, it means you're going to be showing them the pitch and the dynamic and the rhythmic information in a lot of detail. In a way, the object that you're presenting is the pitch, is the dynamics, is the meter is all the nuances in between that is existing in the score. So that you're presenting, but you're presenting it in a very vivid way so that the object that you're presenting. Now, when you were practicing at home, the object was, was quite small and without any feedback from the outside. But when you are on stage, you are presenting it in a way that the details are seen. And not just that, you're allowing the subjectivity of the audience to penetrate into the objectivity of the music, the pitch, the dynamics. And as they are coming in, even if they don't say anything, just because you know that there is an audience already makes you perform a certain way, right? Even if nobody says anything, just to know that somebody is watching makes you increase the dynamic expression, makes you change the way that you express the same piece. So now what's happening is that the object that is there inside the composition, the score is pretty much the same. The score is the same when you're performing at home, when you're playing at home and when you're playing on stage. But that score as an object with you as the performer or the body, as the body, are now showing it in a way that the subjectivity is allowed to come in. The audience are allowed to come in. Now, we are talking about a classical piece. For example, think about it if it was a singer songwriter. Say you were a singer songwriter and uh, you're playing with okay, you're playing with your acoustic guitar and you're playing a, you're playing a live set. The song is going to remain the same. That is, it's going to have an intro, it's going to have a verse one, it's going to have a chorus one, verse two, chorus two, bridge, chorus three, outro. The structure is the same. The number of bars is the same. It's already written. But 
when a singer songwriter is in a in the midst of a performance where he is showing that object he is showing the same object the contents of the object are the same now imagine that song to be a jar like a jar of pickles and it's it's got all this information inside of the verse the chorus the bridge everything all of that information pretty much remains the same but can you imagine in the context of a singer songwriter that the audience really starts to enjoy the chorus you know they really start to enjoy the chorus and when he is in the third chorus he decides to extend two more bars mm -hmm. he decides to extend four more bars he decides to extend eight more bars and not just that he hands over the mic and hands hands the mic over to the audience itself and they start singing the chorus and at that time what exactly is happening the rhythm is probably going off a little bit the pitch is going off because somebody else is singing and like all the details of that so called composition or the object are completely changing but this object with the which the singer songwriter made as a song has now transformed into a very subjective experience which the audience is so much a co-creator of because if he sang it alone it will not have that same impact as opposed to the chorus being sang by 2000 people it now just look at the just imagine the score and try to put your emotions through the score like how you're feeling in the time of the performance you can close your eyes and maybe imagine like when you are performing when you're feeling all those amazing emotions what is how what is have changing in the score now put yourself as the composer as you're performing put yourself in the shoes of the composer now what exactly is changing is that crescendo becoming a little bit longer did it start a little bit earlier like is your legato line having a you know having more notes than it generally had are there more staccatos what's exactly changing in a live performance that that score did not have because you are now breaking down a subjective experience you are having a subjective emotional beautiful experience while performing it's so deep it's so profound it's life changing it's uh, it's nourishing it's enriching and you are able to break that down and look at it as a score because you are now taking a subjective experience and presenting it as an object that is that okay i'm giving more pauses my crescendos are longer so do you think now those if you wrote for this performance if you wrote for that emotion do you think you would write differently that is what we are getting into in this uh, in this whole series we are looking at that now is it making sense a little bit more about subjectivity and objectivity about the score is not a static uh, piece of information the score was yes was written but that's why i wanted to come to this point that if for example like jazz records a lot of the jazz uh, transcriptions that you see are done out of live performances for example you have a lot of jazz drum solos which are transcribed they are insanely uh, they have a lot of complexity in them is because the live performance is transcribed a lot of jazz guitar solos saxophone solos most of them are live transcriptions which if you would study the scores they are ec like eccentric literally so that is kind of what we are trying to do here is that in a classical context when you as a classical pianist are studying a classical score you are memorizing that coming and performing having this beautiful experience and now you closing your eyes going back home after the concert and scoring for your performance that happened that day and now when you score your object which is the score will have subjectivity inside because you have taken into consideration that the audience is going to make the performer or the body feel like this so the body or the performer is going to react like this which means she is going to play 5 beats per minute faster she is going to play 5 bpm faster her crescendos are going to be much 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 longer if they're taking 11 16th notes they're going to take 21 16th notes they're going to be much longer and now when you rewrite it now think about the pauses as well like how many measures of pauses are you going to give how many bars of pauses are you going to give 
if you wrote for this performance do you think that would really transform the way you would write music so now we're going to go in again just uh, rerun over the concept of bodiliness so this is what i've written for bodiliness the concept of bodiliness in sound performativity emphasizes the tangible sensory nature of sound it has weight it has texture and presence much like a physical body now a lot of these things the existence of texture the existence of presence as an aura of emotion everything exists in that performance which does not exist when the same person's probably playing at home it is through the performer's gestures the way they coax sound from an instrument or infuse their voice with emotion that sound takes on this physicality every note played every vocal intonation becomes an embodiment of the performer's inner world a manifestation of their feelings thoughts and creative intentions now moving on from the vocalist comes to the touch of the instrumentalist now this exploration extends to various domains of music and sound from the delicate brush strokes of a pianist's fingers on the keys to the powerful resonance of a vocalist's delivery or even the kinetic energy of a drummer's drum strikes it's a journey that invites us to perceive sound as more than an auditory experience it's tactile it's visual and it's visceral sound as embodiment through the performer invites us to understand music not just as a passive art form but as a dynamic interplay between the artist and the medium where the performer's body becomes the vessel through which the sound comes to life this facet of sound performativity is a profound exploration into the corporeal the tangible and the deeply human aspects of music where the boundaries between the artist and the art blur and sound takes on a life of its own now we're going to come into examples these are the things you need to be noticing so that's the topic the first one is voice and facial expression that is expression of the face as a body of emotional transfer notice the voice notice the facial expression and see how the emotion of the song is being transferred from the object that is the performer to the listener so you can maybe play the you can maybe play the youtube video i would like to say something about the lyrics so if you notice she's talking about a strange fruit okay so she's talking about the fruit and she's describing a very normal situation she's describing about how a fruit when it's ripe it falls off the trees falls to the ground and all the elements take over that is the wind blows it across the sun makes it go ripe and slowly begins to rot it speaks about the tree and the fruit in this way but what else is being spoken about in the middle lines did anyone notice there is another context also happening there's two stories happening in one do you do you get it that they're describing both of it beautifully together like a hanging fruit from the tree is how they're symbolizing the hanging uh, hanging black bodies this is probably during uh, yeah a long time ago during the civil war so they're talking about black men's bodies being hung from the trees and about how the way a fruit would fall from the trees and the way nature would take over after that yeah so when yeah so when they're talking about the fruit they're talking about the natural process of the fruit uh, yeah fruit falling down the wind's taking over and what happens to the fruit it just falls down and the the wind takes it over maybe there's some water 
it takes the fruit away somewhere then when the sun comes out the fruit begins to rot and slowly decay she's referring to two things at the same time she's referring to the fruit and she's referring to the fruit the hanging fruit as black bodies which were hung during the war during the civil war that there was happening at that time so they're talking about bodies being hung and about what happens to those bodies like what happens to those black bodies the way they are hung and the way the bodies would fall and what exactly would happen the winds would take it away the crows would come everything which is happening to the fruit she is describing it with the bodies but what the beauty of the song lies in that even though she she as a person of color wants to express this emotion so deeply she hides the subject now here there is going to be multiple layers of objectivity and subjectivity so i want you to just notice it that's why the lyrics were so important so i kept the lyrics on the screen while sending you the video what is the subject that she wants to express she doesn't care about a fruit she wants to express this story about what happened to those men during that time so she wants to express that event now are we seeing it as an event to some extent that an event occurred in history there are many layers inside this the three things we spoke about was one was an event one was the object and the other was the subject and the performer taking all of this now why i bought this up is i mean it could have been a different song as well but the beauty i saw was that she is using an event an event that happened okay an event that happened then she wants to express her subjective emotions about the event that is how does she feel about the event she wants to express that now what does she do she chooses an object that is the fruit now she uses that fruit and then colors it with the subjectivity of what she wants to say about the event which happened that is the bodies and she paints it now now you start to look at it she is embodying all of these three things at the same time the event that happened the subjectivity that she feels about that event inside an object which is the fruit and now imagine all these three layers inside her as she is performing it how is she expressing it she does not move her hands much she does not sway too much with the body she only does it with her mouth and the facial expression just the way she does her vibratos just the way she is doing her facial expressions she is bringing out the full essence if you will of all of these things because as we are speaking like you yourself said right there was a very uh, dark event that happened you notice the event without her having to try you as the listener or like us all of us you know we've heard this track we are able to go to the event we are able to imagine the event and she's not even tried she's not even tried to bring in the event she's not given any details about the event she's not even told you where it happened she's not even told you who was wrong and who was right she did not even say that this person did bad to this person and this person was the victim and this person was the oppressor no details but the complete subjective feeling of how that event felt has been transferred to the audience so uh, are we able to see the different layers hidden inside a song when it comes to an event and how an object can be used to subjectively express it are you able to see the layers inside of this uh, song like how many layers are there there's many layers in this song layers of uh, interpretation what i'm essentially trying to point at is even mm -hmm. though she does mention the bodies even though she does mention the eyes the bulging eyes the choice of using fruit cuz this story can have so many different objects you don't need to use a fruit you can use anything you want you just have to say the story of the event right like there just of the tons of objects that you could have used to relate to this story the use of fruit comes and the use of the gradual you know rotting and the deterioration of fruit 
it's the connection with the uh, with the event and the fruit is just so uh, what do you say intertwined so well that you can't think of a better object or at least i am unable to and the other one thing i would like to uh, uh, point out is that when the fruit is falling from the tree it's falling because of its weight and the tree which is not able to hold it anymore now do you see the profound meaning behind the choice of the fruit as the object someone describes that a tree is not able to take the weight and then the fruit falls down it's literally the same as what happens in a hanging situation as uh, you know nature takes over over the days the body is not able to take on its weight and is slowly you know beginning to fall come down and all those elements are at play okay so the second one is going to be very lively so we are going to go from horror to a lot of fun in the second song okay so the second song is the snarky puppy lingus just before starting i'll just tell you what to look for so this is point number 2 this is song number 2 and this is point number 2 of how we are experiencing sound as a body so this point number 2 is erasing the lines between the audience and the performers with the same listening and seating arrangements for all which means it's a cohesive listening experience for everyone so i'll just quickly give you a brief so here the headphones that the musicians are wearing and the headphones that the audience is wearing is pretty much in the same room and every musician and every audience member almost feels as if they are the other musician as well so when you are looking at a general performance you are kind of looking at as the performer being the object and the listeners being the subject right the audience being the subject for example uh, one if you said that uh, you know you go to a concert the uh, it's an event where the performer is the object and the audience is the subject now here you're going to be starting to notice just notice just imagine before i play the song just imagine that you are in this kind of a situation imagine yourself in both the situations situation number three situations i'll give you situation number one is you are the player you are either playing the guitar or the piano or uh, you know any of these instruments situation number two is you are the other musician in this uh, in this ensemble and you are waiting for your chance to come and you are listening on your headphones so now you are listening on the headphones along with the audience members right next to you you are this audience member who is sitting literally in the middle of the band who is sitting in the middle of the ensemble and feeling almost like one of the musicians why because they have headphones as much as the other musicians do so these are the three things i want you to notice and i want you to notice how the subjectivity and objectivity are slowly merging and it's one ex whole experience for everyone present in that room so in this piece uh how are you seeing the object and the subject and the performance or the performivity you can say the body like what's in the last one we saw that all of it was happening inside one one person and that one person billy was able to hold on to all of she was able to hold the event she was able to hold the object and she was able to tell her subjective story by being the body by being the object while here we are looking at a very different context we are looking at a context where the listener themselves are a part of the musical experience they are wearing the same headphones as the musicians the brands are different but they are also wearing headphones and the whole thing is coming together as a cohesive unit now how would the experience be if this is what i probably told you before we started the video was how would the experience be if a you were the musician either you were the guitar player or the keyboard player or the drummer or any one of these b you are one of the musicians waiting for your turn to come c you are the audience member like what is your experience happening in a b and c and where is the object where is the subject now if you are an audience member and uh, okay now 
say you're in the front row, okay, you're in the front row of something, and what is it that divides the musicians on stage as opposed to the front row of a concert? The musicians on stage are seen as the performers, are seen as the one who are presenting, and the people off the stage, even if it's just the front row, the front row audience, who is just maybe five feet away from the musicians, but they feel they are the consumers while these are the performers. I wasn't so much as uh, focusing on the headphones as opposed to that element of equality, which an audience member feels that they get to wear something which a musician gets to wear. They get to sit in a place where a musician would be sitting. They get to sit with the, the way the seating is placed within the setting, if you see in the video, is done in a way that the barrier between, okay, this is the performer and this is the receiver seems to seize a bit, seems to reduce a little bit. So if you were in the audience, how would you feel? How would you feel if you were the audience member, not as a musician, but as C? C is just the audience member. How would you feel? The social agreement? Excellent point, yes. The social agreement is what is holding you back. At what point can you stretch that social agreement? How far can you stretch it? Can you imagine a concert? Can you imagine a situation where that social agreement could stretch a little bit more so that the subject and the object tend to merge a little bit or at least tend to not be so separate. Can you explain it? Like, how would it be? Like, because now what you're doing is you're designing a concert where the object and the subject have very little uh, difference between each other. So you're, rem you're actually designing this. Let's go to the next one. Let's play the Ravel one. In this example, focus on the physical constraint of a player leading to intrigue on the body's performance. Now, when you write a piece for the left hand, how is it affecting the performance? That is number one. Number two, do you notice, uh, I mean, ideally we should have played the whole track, but I don't think we have that much time. But if the audience is experiencing this piano, uh, yeah, if, if they're experiencing the full piece, if it was written for two hands, the focus would be on the whole piece. If it was written for both hands, the focus would be on all the parts, that is the orchestral parts and the piano parts, and the focus would shift from the pianist and would come more on the music, on the composition, would come more on Ravel. But here, when you're looking at somebody who's just written a piece for the left hand, and when you see the athleticism with which he's playing it, when you see the uh, when you see the imbalance in the body that she's supposed to literally hold one hand on the side and having to move one thing with the iPad, like one finger with the iPad and is going on absolutely smoothly at such speeds, the physicality of the performance is being highlighted. Like it's almost like Ravel is making the performer handicapped in a certain way by not allowing them to use one hand which means that the full focus of the composition of the audience goes on to the performer and about how she's able to do it with one hand. Now here, in this case, this is a beautiful example in which you can take the focus out of the composition and pretty much bring it in to the player or the embodiment of the performance. Are you seeing that uh, the story behind Ravel, uh, the story behind the piece that someone lost a hand in a war now that story, which is the event, do you, uh, okay, throughout this series, we need to focus on three things that we discussed in the beginning. Number one is the event. Number two is the object. Number three is the subject. So here the event is the thing which happened in the war, that the pianist lost the hand. Now the object is the performer who is now acting. There is an element of acting here. Now Yuja Wong is actually acting like the person who lost his hand, right? 
she is becoming yeah she's literally she's embodying that character she's becoming an actress now she's not just a pianist in this she's an actress as well so she's embodying this person so she's embodying the story of the performer for who it was written that is the object and now when presented in front of the subject that is the audience the focus comes completely to yujawa that is the fact that she is having to play it with one hand and because of that i i feel uh, almost at least a lot of the people in the audience unless they are extremely uninterested would go out and at least google it would i go out and at least research the piece as to why it was written like this which brings the subject that is the audience closer to the event which was that somebody lost their hand in the war are you seeing the connection between the event and the subject the way the composer was bringing the subject to the event without actually saying anything they not said anything but the subject is going to come to the event automatically so this can be one of the points which we can probably keep for a creative assignment at the end of the second session not today this is the second session how do you join a subject to the event after the second class we can discuss this how would you bring a subject closer to an event this is a beautiful example where the audience is brought to the event which is somebody losing their hand in a war the audience is brought to it without saying anything what is the medium yujawang the performer acting like a handicapped person so here the subject is coming to the event now the assignment could be can you imagine or create a concert create something which brings a subject to an event in a very organic manner not forced but organically okay we go on to the next one because uh, i want to finish all of it and we do not have much time okay uh, next one's going to be a fun one it's going to be a rock and roll one uh, paradise city yeah by guns and roses so let's keep this as the last one the next video we'll take for the next lecture so in this one what do you think about the object the object which is generally the lyrics of the song in such a structure take me down to the paradise city where the grass is green and the girls are pretty that's literally all that there is to the writer now like we spoke about in the rovel example that the focus out there was taken away from rovel and taken on to the performer here by making lines which are so relatable singable repeatable and loopable and almost like a earworm the songwriter or you can say the composer has completely taken the light out of themselves has taken the focus out of themselves and put the object in a space in the audience that now the song belongs to everybody when the song belongs to everybody everybody can have a good time when the song belongs to a composer you are out there appreciating the composer you are out there appreciating the object the person who created the object like a painting you are out there you know appreciating what was the thought behind it what was the you know uh, what was the mystique what was the intrigue behind it it's like you're looking at a picasso painting but here it's literally the exact opposite it's created in such a simple and local manner that the composition can literally be passed on to the subject that is the audience the object the composition can literally just be passed on and said you can do whatever you want with it let's all treat it as our own and have fun now what do you think that does to an event what what does that do to the event itself how does writing something so simple transform the relation between the three things we've been speaking all over this is the last question the event subject and object what's happening here so uh what is it doing to the event like here can you look at the subject object and event i uh, like how we have been speaking about what does it do to the event when the object gets transferred to the subject like what happens to the event it becomes less formal do you also feel do you also feel that uh, the structure of the song could be completely done by the audience like the writer or the composer could just give it up 
the audience could make it eight bars, 16 bars, 32 bars, however long they want. One more thing, one more thing. Now, the because when you're looking at, for example, the Ravel piece, when you're looking at the Ravel piece, you're looking at a soloist whose pieces are completely designed, whose parts are completely designed. Now here, imagine if you're a, if you're an average guitar player, don't you think you can like come into this and add more? If the song just kept going on, 128 bars, 256 bars, if the song kept going on, don't you think anybody from the subject can also come and add to the event? But basically anybody can solo over it, right? Anybody can come and solo over it. I mean, they can give it a shot. It's not difficult. It's not, it's doable. I mean, you need, yeah, you need skills. You need to be at least an average guitar player, but you can come in and join. So here, our subject is like, you know, penetrating into the event. And uh, that's one example of where our subject can actually come into the event itself. So I think we'll have to stop now because it's been very long. I had like three more songs left, uh, but we can bump it up to the next one. Yes. And I'll make sure the next one short. Yeah. Uh, we have to stop here and we we okay. see you next week again. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Ciao. Thank you. Great.